Howdy doody everyone, Wombu here. It's been precisely a million billion units of time and or distance since I've made a list celebrating the spook season, and I think it's about time we change that. That's right, we talk in levels, baby. Specifically levels that keep the spine regulated at about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. I googled chilling temperature for that joke. And unlike other lists, there are no rules to keep any of you safe. For you see, I made the title of this video vague. On purpose. Basically legit scary levels will obviously rank up pretty high, though scary levels that are also really likable have a good chance of ranking high as well. At the end of the day, it's evoking some flavor of morbid appreciation that matters. Also, this means levels could be on the list for being scary aesthetically, or for being scary because of the circumstances around it. I'm also defining levels pretty loosely here. I might talk about a particular section of a larger area, or even a place that gets visited multiple times on separate occasions. Really, this criteria is broad as fuck. Understand? Awesome. Don't understand? Even better. Also, I can promise you that I won't jump scare you guys, cause fuck jump scares. Anyway, let's begin. It's touted quite often that the best type of horror is one that scares not based on what it does show, but what it doesn't. A game that can prod your imagination, get you acting paranoid, keep the brain going all over the place, but the fingers hesitant, that's the good shit. But the only thing that may be scarier than a game getting into your head is one getting out of Mr. Kojima's. Legends tell that there has never been a design or narrative idea so stupid that not even Kojima would put it into a game. Such a lust for revenge! Seriously, dude does whatever the fuck he wants regardless of tonal or thematic consistency, and the rest of us just sorta of have to be subject to it. You've been playing Super Mario Sunshine, haven't you? That's, That's not an insult, by the way. That philosophy is likely what gave us this. Fresh out of torture, a naked cartwheeling Raiden is tasked with sneaking past a bunch of elite guards completely unarmed to meet up with Snake and retrieve all his gear. A pretty vulnerable situation as is, but... Is this Pizza Castle? I need scissors. 61. Uh, what? It's these two frequent for comfort codec calls from Colonel and Rose that really ice the cake. Rose is pretty happy to lay some cracks into the fourth wall, but it's the supposed Colonel that really flies off the handle here. In one call, he may be getting weirdly intimate, talking about alien abductions or financial troubles. In another, he might be referencing the first game, or he may just spout a bunch of what we in the professional business call fucking nonsense. It's not the sort of thing that will leave anyone screaming in fear, but it's off-putting, it's random, it gives the player a lot to think about, and above all else, it's just incredibly surreal. Oh, what? You don't think I see you there, punk? The list wouldn't be complete without some sort of jarring nightmare fuel from Nintendo. But what franchise are we pulling from today? Mario? Come on, we're not here to talk about ivory keys or hell valley trees today. Pokemon? What do I look like? Some sort of... Actually, don't answer that. Zelda? I know you've got something for me. So let's not beat around the bush, okay? We all know what the obvious pick is. No, the other obvious pick. No, the other other obvious pick. Yet another brief section of a game, it's fairly easy to do everything you need to do in Bottom of the Well without fully taking in just how fucked this place really is. Not that anyone can really be blamed for wanting the quickest out. What really hits with the Bottom of the Well is that its gruesome purpose is spelled out to the player just enough. Even if you're silly enough to think the red that stains the walls and floors is from some sort of strawberry jam explosion, I'm still running the tests personally, there's death to be found at every corner. Hands that reach from a pool of poison water, skeletons, and piles of skulls that permeate the entire area, invisible holes in a straight up torture chamber. Fuck. And that's still not factoring in those that came alive again as either Redeads or Gibdos, both of which are found here alongside an assortment of other notorious enemies. But you know who the baddest of the bad boys is? It's me. 
But I'll also give you points if you said Dead Hand, an admittedly easy mini-boss who regardless manages to reveal more and more grotesque details the more you interact with it. Like the fact that it twitches when it dies, its blood is green in spite of the splashes on it being red, and the room you fight it in being textured entirely with skulls. And the fact that this, along with everything else we've talked about, has existed underneath Kakariko Village for presumably a long ass time, I invite you all to come to whatever conclusions can be made about that little tidbit. This next entry in our journey of spookdom goes out to all the Hollow Knight fans out there. Fuck Deep Nest! No, seriously, fuck Deep Nest. Hollow Nest, the overworld of Hollow Knight, is already a kingdom that exists mostly underground. This is like if your creepy basement had a creepy basement. No area in Hollow Knight is more unabashedly unpleasant than Deep Nest. The visibility is limited, the space is claustrophobic, the layout is easy to get lost in, the tamer areas are few and far between, the environmental hazards are abundant, promise tomorrow I don't have a date even though I'm so handsome, and the enemies here are goddamn relentless. If slowly fighting for space with an enemy that takes two masks of damage a hit off of you doesn't sound like your idea of fun times, then how about having little weavers coming at you from the foreground? At the very least, it's less annoying than having dirt carvers ambush you from underground constantly. Even some of the enemies you kill will occasionally grow a fresh set of legs for round two. God damn it, not even the grubs are safe. Not even the fucking grubs! Trying to get into my head, huh? Well, it ain't gonna work. It worked. One more interesting thing to note is the presence of the failed tramway, which implies that they actually tried to build a fully developed transportation infrastructure in a place like this. And you're telling me that didn't work out? <laughs> <laughs> they got a hot spring in there at least. So you guys might be a bit surprised at the absence of any levels from Amnesia The Dark Descent on this list. And that's not to say it didn't make the list at all, but it totally didn't make the list at all. Nah, instead I did some really fringe shit and pulled from its predecessor. Hey Wambu, this is a weird fucking bick, better start explaining. So in Penumbra Black Plague, the protagonist explores a research facility post-virus attack, where most of the personnel have either been killed or turned into reanimated corpses. Your journey through the facility eventually lands you in its kennels, which in and of itself is a pretty bad omen, since infected dogs were the most prominent enemies of the first game. And not only are the dog houses in this area empty, but the sounds of barking and howling can be heard all around. Here's the thing though, you don't encounter the infected dogs, and any dogs you do encounter are already dead. Uh-oh. Rest in peace, puppos. You're pure beans. You're, you're, pure, you're pure beans, all of you, even, even though you're, you're dead. In fact, there are seemingly no enemies here, but approaching an area of intense darkness will give you the warning that something is crawling inside the walls, which, as we all know, is totally normal and not worth worrying about. Yes, it is. You're gonna fucking die. Eventually, you come across a report on the workings of the facility's chief overseer, Wilbur Frisk. After the virus attack, Frisk hid himself away in the kennels and developed a sort of kinship with the dogs, and by kinship, I mean he reverted back to a feral state and started eating both dogs and people. With this transformation came a fear of light, thus Frisk only attacks in areas of darkness, and any portions where you do have to move around in the dark require the player to block off the grimy tunnels in the wall that Frisk has dug himself. And at no point will you ever actually see Frisk, but very often you will hear him hustling to come get ya. This sort of cat and mouse dynamic, it's pretty typical for horror, but rather than being chased or tracked down, your threat is always watching from inside the walls, waiting for his chance to attack. Sorry if any of you were already afraid of the dark, by the way. I am so thoroughly not helping. You know, they say home is where the heart is, but like... But like... Was that too tasteless? That might have been a bit tasteless. But nah, seriously, I'm actually kind of afraid to make any jokes about this one. Everything I'd seen about Max Payne prior to actually playing it looked kinda campy, but man, the first game just doesn't fuck around. Right off the bat, as our titular protagonist is narrating to us about his American dream lifestyle with a family and... 
beautiful home. Said home turns promptly to shit. Explore further and the muffled screams and yelling eventually build to the gut punch that Max's wife and newborn child were both murdered brutally by a pack of junkies. And honestly, that probably would have been enough to land on this list, but no, they just had to go the extra mile, didn't they? Max's home actually gets revisited through two dream sequences. Or should I say, nightmare sequences? What, do I not get lightning or anything for that one? Man, whatever. The nightmare sequences take us through a more abstract, yet equally horrifying version of the house, with long maze-like halls, bloody pathways, the constant screams of the deceased wife and child, and in the case of the second nightmare, fire. And all of it is explored through this slower, spacier movement, which forces the player to take it in, even if they were to rush their way out. And above all else, that might be what lends Max's home all the more potency. It's not just horrible and traumatic, it's inescapable. And on a chilling note, that's how the one boy does it. Oh wait, seriously? I get to talk about Bioshock? Oh, sick! No wait, not sick, not sick, not sick at all. Who, who's sick here? There's no such thing as sick. Don't be silly. <laughs> Bioshock had a strong introduction already in the form of Welcome to Rapture, but when it comes to really cementing just how bonkers the world of Rapture really is, Medical Pavilion just goes above and beyond. Speaking personally, I've played through Bioshock in its entirety almost 10 times, I'm kind of a fan of the game you could say, and not only has Medical Pavilion not lost its potency, it may have gotten even stronger. Turns out increasing the dosage made everything worse this time. It may not seem too bad initially, especially when you're given a machine gun really early on, but what's amazing is that you can actually pinpoint the exact moment where the nightmare fuel really comes in. It's right here. Ah, oh, shut the fuck up, Atlas. The introduction of Adam, a substance that gifts its user with extraordinary powers, and more importantly, self-healing, swayed Medical Pavilion to become less so a place for healing, and more for cosmetics. A place where you could shape your own you. Except, oopsie boopsie, Adam actually sinks your mental state and destroys your physical appearance. Now the place is residence to a bunch of ugly, screaming crazies, and the few working doctors that just end up killing them anyway. By far, we see some of the most erratic behavior from the splicers in this part of the game. Overseeing all the screaming crazies, though, is top crazy Dr. Steinman, who sees Med Pavilion less as his job, but more as his canvas. He's there as a sculptor, mutilating his patients to fit his own artistic vision. And he takes inspiration from Picasso because of fucking course he does. Aphrodite tells him to kill people. No, seriously, Aphrodite tells him to kill people. I'm not making that up. Now, Met Pavilion has really made its foothold on lists like these, and rightfully so, to the point where people reference very specific parts to highlight, and I'm not about to be the exception. Most people point to Painless Dental with its pretty infamous jump scare, but eh, it's not even that bad. No, I'm actually going to single out the Twilight Fields Funeral Homes. Here, you're ambushed in two fairly unorthodox ways, with one splicer frantically throwing a casket off of its stand to charge at you, and the other one taking place in the single most off-putting room Med Pavilion has to offer. And all the while, this discordant organ drones in the back. Yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn this off. Moving on. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. You guys. Hey. Hey, you guys. Let's go to Ravenholm. Yes, we do. This is my channel, damn it. Looking back, Ravenholm above all else was a risk, and here's what I mean. This is the place you go to shortly after getting the gravity gun, a weapon that by all means should make for maximum piss taking. Like, no doubt the players would gear up for a physics playground, and then this is what you get. There's so many ways this weapon could have torn apart any sense of fear, but it just lands regardless. It's quite the departure from fighting the oppressive organization that is the Combines, even though it totally still has their stink all over it. Ravenholm was originally a secret 
secret stronghold for refugees that escaped the Combine-controlled City 17. Once it could no longer fly under the radar, though, the Combine launched a bombardment of head crabs their way, and the head crabs followed suit. I think what's so effective is the constant air of loneliness. The more you travel up and around Ravenholm, and the more enemies you encounter, the more it sinks in that this place was well and truly wiped. Okay, well, there is the priest, Father Grigori. His mental stability is questionable, but he throws a shotgun at you, and in general, I kind of enjoy his company. Compounding that sense of loneliness, though, is the fact that aside from right at the beginning, there is no soundtrack. Just the ambient noises, which only really serves to make the desolation feel even more real. It also helps because the predominant enemies of this area make some of the most horrific noises you will ever hear in a video game. <laughs> Can I talk about that, by the way? I think a lot of people have grown kind of skeptical of zombies. They feel so dime a dozen in video games especially, but headcrab zombies are just in a different league altogether. Their existence both looks and sounds like sheer torture, and the mortality of their hosts is left slightly ambiguous, as evidenced by the sounds I played for you mere moments ago. Here it is again, in case you missed it. God, help! Help me! Now, admittedly, I didn't rank Ravenholm as high as I was originally going to. For as atmospherically strong as it is, and for as scary headcrab zombies are, in spite of what I said at the beginning of this entry, there are times where it is comedically easy to dispatch the zombies with environmental hazards. No, that is- that is not seriously where you chose to sleep. No, come on, don't- <laughs> Come on. I couldn't not, okay? I couldn't not, okay? Yeah, this list just doesn't have any boundaries because fuck sensible expectation. It's the spook season, okay? I just want to have fun. It's been a little while now since this game stopped being playable. You're you're just the fucking worst, Konami. But in case you forgot, PT does not stand for psychological torture, though that would be pretty apt. It actually stands for playable teaser. And looking back, it really says something that this sampler basically bodied every horror game of that year. Well, except maybe Alien Isolation. FNAF was also huge back then. Also, Whistleblower totally redeemed Outlast after its dumpster ending, and I am getting very sidetracked. The entire experience is just one area. It's the same hallway looping over and over again. The first time you go through it, someone on the radio basically goes, So yeah, three families dead. Any other hint of what's going on pretty much is never given to the player directly. With each loop, the corridor starts to change, sometimes in very subtle ways, and sometimes in a bit more obvious ones. In order to progress, you gotta be looking out for even the smallest changes, which by its very nature forces the player to observe and maybe even appreciate the game's attention to detail. Maybe the radio has something more to say, or maybe there's something with this photo. Maybe the game will nudge you towards its bathroom, or maybe it'll nudge you towards your real-life bathroom. And all the while, there's always that looming sensation of being followed, because you totally are, by the game's ever-present apparition, Lisa. There is one major jump scare involving her, which I won't show because I'm a man of my word, you're welcome, fuck jump scares, but I will say it's kind of brilliant in that it makes the mere act of turning around one of the most anxiety-inducing things ever. I'm serious, when I looked up footage for this game, I grabbed all the nearest paper bags and hyperventilated into all of them. Oh, well, thanks, game. It's kind of gross looking, but I guess it could do the trick. I could do nothing but walk. And then. Okay, okay. The paper bag is talking to me. But yeah, on the whole, this is easily one of the scariest places a game has put me in. For an environment so repetitious, it was wholly unpredictable. Damn it, Undertale. I just can't quit you. So, here we are. Coming off the goofs and gaffs of dating a weird porcupine woman, Undertale took such a bizarre shift in tone where the typical charm was still very much present, albeit estranged, and my god, I couldn't love it more. The true lab on the outset is one of the more lonely areas in the game. NPCs are nowhere to be found and the encounters are no longer random, yet it's less so abandoned and more frantically hidden away from the rest of the world. Thankfully, reading the monitors scattered throughout the lab shows us what the deal is. Originally, this lab was used by the 
aforementioned porcupine woman Alfie's to hospitalize fallen monsters and extract their souls to try and break the barrier that separates monsters from the rest of humanity. Problem is, doing so kills the monsters. So to sustain their life force, Alfie's infused them with a healthy dose of human determination, which seemingly worked until it didn't. Now the dark, grimy halls of this weirdly laid out hospital act as more of a prison for its newly mutated patients. The amalgamates above all else are what makes this area punch as well as it does. They make for the weirdest encounters in the game, and they're all just horribly grotesque, but what's amazing is that this is in the pacifist route specifically. Your only option is to befriend these guys, the same way you would every enemy before them. And why not? They still have families on the outside that are waiting for their return. It's Alfie's who keeps them sequestered in here for fear of having to confront her mistakes. That is, until you go down there. You can see why I have kinda mixed feelings on Alfie's, by the way. True Lab as a whole, on the other hand, look, my love for this place is unbridled. It's got a powerful story behind it, some really creative monster designs with their own humanizing features, and it still sees the player doing something good. It'll fuck you up one second and hand you a nice bag of potato chips the next. It's basically perfect. Perhaps this was the real reward for the pacifism the whole time. I'm fucked up. At the end of it all, it just wouldn't feel right sticking my favorite scary level at the top spot, would it? True Lab can sit there at number two, knowing that it has my heart, but the number one has gotta go to the level that scared me the most. So, what franchise was able to do that? Oh good, and uh, which game in the franchise? Oh good, uh, so what level exactly? Oh good. Hey Wombo, you seem to have this thing about hospitals. Oh no shit! There's a reason hospitals lend themselves well to horror. They're places where people at their most vulnerable surrender themselves to the care of others. And generally, they're clean, they're pleasant enough, but they still house sick, injured, or even dying people. And that juxtaposition can feel pretty uninviting. So take that setting, desolate it, and give it to a champion of atmospheric horror, and yeah, this was just inevitable. Allow me to set the scene really quickly. Name's James, wife is dead, gets letter from wife anyway, explores Silent Hill, meets little girl who knows dead wife, meets woman who isn't dead wife, but is, but isn't, but is, but also isn't, pursue little girl into my fucking nightmares. How can you sit there and eat pizza? The Silent Hill 2 iteration of Brookhaven Hospital is the one area in the game that has given me the overwhelming urge of just wanting out. And unlike Medical Pavilion or True Lab, it has virtually nothing to do with the circumstances around it. No, this is just purely the experience of being there. At first, it may seem like your typical rundown hospital, albeit filthier, but there's all kinds of symbolism involving the personal struggles of our protagonist and the fears of those physically or mentally ill. In the back half of your time here, the hospital undergoes an otherworldly transformation, where the dirty dryness of the environment becomes greener, moldier, and tarped over. It's kinda subtle, cause this is the point of the game where it sort of flirts with abstraction rather than diving fully into it. Above all else, Silent Hill 2 pulls its horror out of sheer loneliness. Any actual human life is mostly hinted at through documentation, and the people you do meet always seem to have some kind of screw loose. So comfy. Yeah, this ain't top 10 shitty ideas, toots. Get the fuck out of bed! Does this place seem in any way inviting? Because baby, 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 we still haven't even talked about the enemies. And it really says something when I'm sitting here like, oh, hey, Pyramid Head, good to see you again. Don't get me wrong, he's terrifying, but I can hardly even stand to look at the flesh lips. Thankfully, they're only in one encounter. You don't gotta deal with them for very long, but I fucking hate the bubble headed nurses. Their weird, tumorous, clay like faces, the way they they walk, seeing one of them coming towards me is nothing but pure anxiety. Of all the entries on the list, Brookhaven is the one that I absolutely cannot stand, but in the way that makes it the most fitting number one. The atmosphere is masterful, the symbolism behind it is fascinating, the overall experience is suspenseful, intriguing, and is perfectly placed in the context of the game, and seriously, fuck the nurses, fuck, okay, fuck you. We're done, okay? That's it. I hope you guys have enjoyed this spook special, and if it's not even close to Halloween at the time you're watching this, don't write a snarky comment to me about it. You ain't clever, you ain't smart. Seriously though, have a good one. <laughs>